Welcome back to the Meeple Marathon. Today we're going to talk about how to set up and play Dinosaur Island Roar and Write. Uh, similar to our uh, set up and how to play video for Dinosaur World, I'm going to cover the basics of setup and then show you what the differences are for solo. And then after we cover how to play, I'll show you the differences of uh, what you need to know to play solo. So uh, setup for this game is incredibly easy, so easy. In fact, I am going to start from uh, cracking open the box here so you guys can literally see how easy it is. You want to take all your dice and put them into this massive dice bag. Set it off to the side for now. You want to go ahead and give everybody two sheets. All right, one with this grid on top and the other one with all of the other various things. Give each person a sheet. And we're going to set up this board here in the middle. You're going to want to, if you want, pass out erasers, pass out, pass out pencils, um, and give the first player token to whoever is going to be the first player. This is the round marker, and it's going to start here on this first little box next to the one. Then you are going to take two decks of cards, your building cards, your specialist cards, you're going to give them a shuffle and you're going to deal three out like so. One, two, three. And one. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is all you need to do to set up a game of Dinosaur Island Roar and Write. Uh, if it is your first game, they recommend you not playing with specialists with this um, shell symbol here. This just signifies that this is a more advanced specialist. Uh, they want you to get your feet under you. Um, otherwise, all buildings and all specialists are fair game. So. Let's just quickly take a look at what you need to do to set up for the AI. You want to get out your third deck of cards. Give this a shuffle. All right. And then you want to take one, two, three, four, five cards, and you're going to flip them over, very similar to Dinosaur World, so that you can read the objective word there and you're going to take a look at these and these are going to represent objectives that you want to meet again you don't have to meet them but they are going to give you bonus victory points at the end of the game so for example this one you simply need to have three herbivores in your park this one you need to have four merchandise shops which is the maximum in your shop this one's one of each type of dinosaur this one is three small carnivores and this one is two of each of the basic attractions so at this point once you have dealt five to yourself you want to choose say for example you're gonna go shop heavy you're gonna have a very safe park so uh, you're gonna have herbivores and lots of shops in your park you save three off to the side you need to set them somewhere where you can see them face up and then you're gonna take the remainder of the cards, shuffle them back in, the two that you discarded, and you're gonna create a face down AI stack, which we will talk about once we discuss how to play Dinosaur Island Roar and Write. Okay, so before we go through the steps of actually playing the game, I want to just discuss uh, the resources that you are collecting and how you are going to mark these on your sheet. Um, Essentially, uh, starting over here on your, you don't have to place this on the left, I guess, but most people do. That's how they show you in the instructions. But this is going to be your park map where you're going to be drawing Tetris style shapes and connecting them with the roads and trying to make it to the various exits, similar to Railroad Inc. If you're familiar with that roll and write game, you want to be able to make a connection from HQ down to um, three different exits, and then you can accumulate those points at the end of the game. Um, but the main, the two main resources in the game are your DNA and your coins. Now, DNA, as you collect DNA, you're going to circle the box. 
um, put like a circle around the outside of the box and then as you use it you're going to make an X similar to this sheet right here you can see that I have used one two three four yellow DNA and I had one in reserve now if at any point you ever accumulate so much DNA that you get to this 15th spot every DNA that you collect after that is automatically converted into a coin which is the second main resource that I want to talk about coins coins are how you uh, purchase buildings both your basic attractions and your uh, uh, special buildings that are lined up over here so you can see that the the A, B, and C here simply line up with A, B, and C here. Same thing with the specialists. You use coins to hire the basic specialists, security chief, tour guide, and junior scientist, as well as the A, B, and C specialists that are listed here, A, B, and C specialists. So again, as you collect DNA, you circle it, and then you cross through it as you use it. However, coins you are going to automatically spend. You spend those coins by simply drawing through, Xing out, circling in, however, coloring in, however you want to do it, the, the coin that you want to spend. So then, for example, once I have crossed through these first three coins, I can put X here and I now have the security chief. I have now hired the security chief. So a little bit different how you handle those resources, um, but you can always come down here and you can always bank up to five coins over the course of the game. In that case, you would circle a coin that you're banking, and then when you want to use it later on in the game, you would cross through it. There are some additional resources that you're going to collect throughout the game. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is roads. Roads are going to be needed to connect your buildings on your grid map here. Buildings cannot touch uh, in any way, even at a corner. So there has to be at least one full cube uh, in between them in all directions. So you're going to have to connect those buildings by roads so when you do your cheap tour similar to Dinosaur World you have a way to get from building to building. Normally when you collect a road you use it instantly by drawing it on your map somewhere but if you don't know where you want to put it or you have no place to put it you can bank up to five roads over the course of the game again circling when you bank them Xing through when you use them. Similar to here, you can see back on a former park sheet of mine, I banked four roads and ended up using four roads. But you can even see I left this building unconnected and I left this building unconnected. All right, another resource that you uh, may be collecting throughout the game is excitement. Now, you're going to gain excitement um, for doing things like creating dinosaurs. Here you can see the numbers you get for each time you create that dinosaur. You earn excitement, say for example, when you uh, hire the tour guide, he's gonna give you instant excitement. When you uh, do your Jeep tour, your ride is gonna get you excitement. Anytime you gain excitement, you are simply gonna circle that many boxes on this sheet. And it's important that you don't cross through them or color over them because you wanna be able to see these icons throughout the entire game because during your tour, your park tour, when you get to um, part four here of your park tour, you're gonna gain each one of these resources that you have circled. So it's important that you see them and you're gonna get them a cumulative amount. It's not like once you get this DNA, you don't get any more. You're always gonna get this first DNA. So that is excitement. That's how you track excitement. The next thing is threat. Uh, if you're familiar with Dinosaur Island or Dinosaur World, you're familiar with the little red pips. That is the threat that you gain from A, bringing dangerous dinosaurs into your park. But also, similar to Dinosaur World, there's gonna be threat on the dice that you uh, choose and you are gonna take threat possibly from taking an action that somebody's already taken. So we'll see that here in a second. But when you take threat, you're going to fill in a dot just like this on uh, this grid here, starting from left to right and just filling from top to bottom. If, however, you acquire security, which is important to counteract the threat and you always wanna have, ideally, more security than threat, you circle that dot. So again, if we look back to one of my former sheets here, you can see that I've accumulated threat, but then I've circled that threat 
And so as long as I have a circle around each of the dots, I'm not taking any deaths at the end of the game. So, or at the end of the round, sorry. Okay, so we have talked about DNA. We've talked about coins, roads, excitement, threat, security, um, and really that's pretty much it. Again, you could accumulate death. You're usually going to only accumulate death if your security is out of whack. And in that case, you're gonna to have to deal with um, you know, an event happening in your park. So for every uh, exclamation point that you have to cross through here, which is a death you acquire, you're gonna to have to come over here and do something bad to your park, whether it's lose a dinosaur paddock, lose uh, some roads, lose a building, lose some basic DNA, or I think this is any DNA actually, or lose a specialist. Ideally, you don't ever let any deaths happen in your park, but this, this could really mess with you here. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a few of the things that we need to do before uh, we actually even get started with the game to prep our, um, uh, prep our sheets here. The first thing you wanna do is to simply help you uh, remember. Let's move all of this up just actually. That's probably about as high as it goes. Um, you want to go ahead and look and see how much do these buildings cost? Nine, six, and six. And you want to start filling out from the end of the row, so the bottom right, in this case, the C building, which is T Rex Jet Ski Park, you would only cross out this first coin. That means once you have accumulated nine coins, they're all full, and you X through that. I guess you really don't have to do that, but it is handy to see visually that once you, you know, which ones are further along, which ones are closer to the end without having to constantly look at the um, back up at the cards. So for example, A and B here, we would cross through one, two, three, four coins back. So then we only have to accumulate six coins to get the building. You wanna do the same thing for the specialists, uh, four, five, and three. So this one you would do uh, one coin. Here you would do none, because you need to get all five coins to hire the cloning expert. And then the chaos theorist, you can do one, two <coughs> coins uh, there. That uh, is all they uh, tell you to do in order to get ready to prep your pads. So I'm gonna put the pads off to the side for a minute because the next um, uh, thing we're gonna talk about, it really just has to do with this board here and the DNA dice. So what you're gonna do is you're going to draw out of your fancy bag here a certain number of dice based on the player count. That um, number is, I believe, five, seven, and nine based on two, three, or four players. So we're just gonna pretend we're playing a uh, two-player game here. We're going to draft five dice, and we're gonna give them a roll. You can see that these dice are much similar to Dinosaur Island's dice, whereas they have the threat pips on them. They have things other than DNA. Dinosaur World dice only have DNA on them. So just keep that in mind. You cannot substitute Dinosaur World dice for Dinosaur Island Roar and Write dice. Now, you're gonna, roar, you're gonna bleh, roll all of these dice out, and then in a multiplayer game, you just simply are gonna place them out so everybody can see. Then in turn order, so again, whoever has that uh, first player token, and then play passing to the left from there, the first player gets to draft any dice that they so choose. So say they are um, really looking for advanced DNA, they'll take this one. And then the next player would go, and they're gonna get to claim a dice. Well, they're then, in a two-player game, gonna get to go again. So say they are looking for blue and yellow DNA, they're gonna take this one, and then it comes back to the first player and say they want some coins. So, um, what's left behind, first of all, what we just saw is called a snake draft. That means that no matter what the player count is, you start at first player, second player, third player, whoever's the last player then gets to draw twice and order moves backwards through the line. So if you're the first player, you get the first, but then last pick. Uh, and if you're the last player, you get two picks in a row. But whichever dice is left behind, everybody 
uh, is going to gain these resources. They're going to mark them off on their sheet. Either, like for example, a row, they're either going to have to instantly place or circle on their sheet somewhere. They can mark this DNA, but they're also going to gain this threat. So that's something to consider if you are the very last person choosing and you're about to draw these dice, you may, for example, draw this one. You know, it's gonna give everybody a coin and a blue DNA, but you're also only taking one threat. So, something to consider. Once you have, everybody has claimed what's on the die face of this one, this one can go back into the bag. We don't need this one anymore. Then, what you're going to do, again, in player order, is place your dice onto these uh, dice placement locations to gain what is to the left here. So let's just briefly look at these. This is make four dinosaurs. So that is again, spending your DNA up here. And basically you spend what's here. It's very straightforward, very simple. Um, you know, the uh, large carnivores are nothing but uh, advanced DNA. The um, Herbivores are nothing but uh, basic DNA. Gosh, sorry. Um, but again, it's only two apiece. So you're gonna be crossing through those. And when you do actually create a dinosaur for the first time, say you wanna create a Brachiosaurus, you are gonna go ahead and draw a two by two grid on your map. It can go anywhere. It can go up against a wall. It can go up against an exit. It just cannot go up against the HQ or any other building. And that includes going at the corners. Um, so for example, if you build a T-Rex for the first time, you have to draw a four by four grid. You can see here in this game, I built a Megalosaurus pen and a Spinosaurus pen. Actually, I built all three. So here are those three big pens that I built throughout the game. Once you've built the pen, you don't have to build another one every time you create a dinosaur. You simply spend the DNA, mark it off, and we assume that they are happily living in the pen with the other dinosaurs of their type. Um, we'll come back and look at that here in a little bit more in a minute, but you basically place a die here to make up to four dinosaurs. If you place one here, you get either two coins or two security. This one's pretty straightforward. This one you put down, you either get two basic DNA or one advanced DNA, pretty straightforward. I'm gonna skip over this one for a second, come down here. Here, you get either three roads. Again, you either have to immediately draw them into your park or bank them, or you can build a basic attraction. That is on these other sheets, and those are represented here, either a merch shop, a ride, or a food stand. If you take the build attraction action, you choose which one of these you want to build, you cross off the box, there's no money that has to be spent, no DNA that has to be spent, you simply have taken that action, you build one of these three, and then you have to fit this shape into your park. Again, you can see here, I had uh, a food stand here, and this looks like a, um, what was this, a ride maybe, or a merch shop. Um, I'm not sure, this is probably a special building, but you can see I had plenty of food stands here. Maybe that was one of my objectives. Um, you don't have to put the letter in here. You only put the letter for the uh, dinosaurs. And then again, once you do your park tour, you're going to gain these benefits that are just next to the black and white arrow, but we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So let's go back to the one we skipped. For the most part, when you put your dice down, if it's the first, if you are placing it for the first time, you're the first person to fill that spot, it really doesn't matter what your dice face is, but whichever dice you drafted, you do need to keep it that face up because it is gonna matter to the next person, except for this space. This space, you can gain double what the die face is. So say for example, I put this here, you, you got one coin for drafting this die. You're now gonna get two coins, but all your opponents gain what's on the die face. So say for example, you're feeling very generous and you put this here, you're gonna gain two roads, two yellow DNA, but you're also gonna get everyone else playing one yellow DNA and one road. Again, which they have to bank or spend immediately. So this one is important that you it matters what the die face is that you put down. Now, let's say for example, 
you're playing in a larger game of four people and you're the fourth person to go and these are the three dice that have been placed down in front of you. Now, you could take your die and put it up here or here, take either one of those two actions, no penalty. If, however, you want to take one of these actions, these spaces are not necessarily blocked. You can still go there, but you're gonna have to take threat represented of the die that you're covering up. So if you were to cover up this one here to take the build attraction action, you actually gain no threat because the person underneath you was rather nice and, and left that for you. You having two threat on your thing doesn't matter to you, but it would matter if somebody put their die on top of yours. Um, if you put your die on top of here, you're taking two threat just to place and take that action. If you put your die on top of here, you're taking one. Now, say I place mine here, I gather my DNA, and then it comes back around to the next person, and we'll just take a die out here. And they also want to extract DNA. So they're like, screw it, I am willing to take the threat, I really need DNA this turn, I'm gonna put my die here. They only have to take two threat. They don't have to look all the way to the bottom. You only take the threat from the die face that is showing, that you're immediately covering up. So uh, again, if someone were to have come behind you and done this, taken two threat, and then you come behind them and do that, you take no threat. Even though they take two threat, they covered it up and the die that they're leaving behind has no threat. So this stacking rule um, matters. Uh, the die face matters. So again, after you claim your dice in the drafting phase and you've written down your resources on your sheet, do not change the die faces because it matters what they are. Also down here at the bottom of the card, you can see that at any point in time, you can take two coins that you have either just earned, you don't have to bank them, or you can spend two coins from your bank to give yourself an advanced DNA, a road, or a security. So if at any point you are desperate for one of these, you can spend two coins to do so. Now, the dice drafting phase and then placing of dice that we just showed you happens twice in a row. So you're gonna go through a full dice draft, you're gonna go through a full round of placing. Each person is gonna place two dice on the board. And just so you guys are aware, the other side of this board is for four players. You can actually see that two of these slots have two places you could put a die without taking any penalty. So they give you a few more spots when you're playing with more players. But um, So that's what this round marker is to signify. A dice drafting phase, a dice drafting phase. Then you're going to go on your uh, park tour phase. So again, after you've done two rounds of what we just went through, you're going to come back to your sheets here and we are going to go, mainly we're gonna look on this right sheet and we're gonna stop from at the top and we're gonna go in numerical order, one, two, three, four, five. So the first thing we're gonna do is, have we put any attractions into our park? Um, if you, example, have put a merch merchandise shop in your park for every merchandise shop that you have crossed off. I didn't in this game, but say I had crossed off two, you would take two dice from the bag, you would roll them out in front of you, and you would gain the resources instantly. You'd write them down, you could spend them coins immediately, whatever you wanted to do. Ride, you gain one excitement for each ride that you have up. So again, you are circling these boxes. Food, you're gonna gain coins that you can then again spend immediately. And you notice that Attractions are first, so if you gain coins here to spend them to hire one of these people, you're gonna to get to use them in the next step, which is step two. So when you hire specialists, you immediately always gain what's next to the lightning bolt here. So when you hire the security chief, you immediately gain two security. But then every time you go on a tour, if you have hired him, you gain one security. Or say, for example, I just gained a coin from the food stand. I just filled him out just a second ago. I'm going to get three security, basically, one, two, three, because we're going to immediately start here. You also, during this second phase, going to look to any specialists that you've hired here. Again, they each have an instant 
action that you will take when you hire them, and then they each have an action with the black and white arrow that you will take during the park tour, again, if you've hired them. The order that you go through and activate these specialists, whether it be these guys or these guys, does not matter. You just have to activate all of your specialists that you want to after the attractions and before your dino tour. All right, so after we've done attractions and specialists, and just so you guys are aware, the attractions are the only buildings that you're activating during the tour because when you uh, purchase these special buildings, they're gonna give you an instant bonus of some sort, but then for the most part, they're just either giving you end game VP or end game VP based on some calculation here. They don't ever give you park tour uh, capabilities. So that's why you don't see them anywhere on this right sheet. They're tucked over here. But let's get back to our park tour here because now we're gonna go on our dino tour. So our dino tour, similar to Dinosaur World that you have to draw a continuous line from your, in this case, headquarters. And then what you wanna do is make it to one of these exits, hopefully. Because if you make it to the exit on a park tour, you can then circle that and you're gonna get that po those points at the end of the game. So more than likely what happened here is that my first round simply probably went to the uh, Spinosaurus pen and then left. And then my second one probably passed through Spinosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and then through the food stand and went out the five. And the final one here, you can see, uh, it looks like I went boop, 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 boom. So what you're gonna do is can making sure you can connect the buildings via roads, you're gonna see how far you can get. And again, if you make it to an exit, you're gonna circle that because you can't go to the same exit twice. You can, but you're not gonna get double the points. As you start passing through buildings, you're going to put a little X up in the corner of that building. That's because the next time, similar to the boredom characteristic in Dinosaur World, the next time you pass through that building, you're not gonna gain excitement on that tour. But the first time you pass through a building, one, two, three, say you went one, two, three, and went out of the five, you're gonna gain three excitement for each unmarked, basically any type of building visited, then mark with an X. So count up your excitement first, and then go back and mark your path with an X. So that doesn't mean you cannot pass through these buildings again on your dinosaur tour. You just don't gain the excitement for passing through them again. Once you have finished your dino tour over here on this sheet, you're gonna to look to your excitement. And again, you just recently circled some boxes, hopefully, based on your dino tour. So now that you have um, been updating your excitement level, you're gonna go through and you're gonna gain every resource that you see circled. And again, you can um, acquire these in any order you so choose. So say for example, we were here and we had we had gotten up to this point and we say, all right, I've just gained one, two, three coins. You could instantly cross through one, two, three coins of the tour guide, instantly gain three more excitement and then circle one, two, three, and now all of a sudden you've gained a second advanced DNA because you're still in this phase. Um, now, if you happen to say, all right, one, two, three, and you're going to um, you know, use it to get your junior scientist here, you cannot then turn, you will instantly get two advanced DNA up here, but you cannot turn on and make two dinosaurs because we have already done this arrow during phase two. We're down in phase four now. But if you gain excitement during phase four, you instantly count it and then instantly gain those bonuses. The last thing you're gonna do is come down here to the death toll, step five, and you're gonna look at your security versus threat. And if you have any threat that is not covered up or circled by a security circle, you're going to cross through the next uh, box here and any exclamation boxes that you cross through, you're gonna have to come over here and decide which uh, catastrophes are gonna happen to your park. So for example, here you would lose an entire dinosaur paddock. So I've been showing you this one, but this board actually um, 
I didn't want to confuse you guys, you can see that I acquired some decent death in this game, and I came over here and decided, all right, I'm going to kill two dinosaur paddocks. And so I x through my Brachiosaurus paddock and my Triceratops paddock. Now, I still get credit for these at the end of the game. I still get credit for having created my three Brachiosaurus and my one Triceratops. I also had to kill off three roads. So you can see I colored into these three roads. You don't erase because you cannot build there. You know, it's a demolition site. You can't turn around and build another Brachiosaurus pen there. You're done. You still get credit for having created them during end game scenario, but you uh, cannot um, add any more to this pen. Now, say I wanted to create a fourth Brachiosaurus, I could do that. I would just need to draw a new four or two by two pen and write B in it. So um, these are all pretty self explanatory, but for the most part, you are crossing through them, losing them on your map over here, except for. Uh, DNA. In that case, you would simply X through any circles that you have over here on the track or specialists. You're simply going to put a big X or cross through whatever specialist you uh, have acquired and they're no longer able to be used. You have to fire them, I guess you could say. All right, but that's it. After you have gone through your park tour, which is again the black and white arrow, and the black and white arrow up here, you're going to move on to the next round, the next season, I guess you could say. And again, go through two more uh, DNA dice drafting phases, one more park tour, and then do it all again a third time. So there's only three full rounds of the game, and then you're done. And again, each time you enter a new dice drafting phase, you are going to pass the first player marker. When you are taking your park tour, this is an action that can be done simultaneously, so there is no first player. So just think of it that way, that every time you pass this cube onto a new uh, yellow cube symbol, you pass the yellow amber first player marker. And again, that is um, pretty much it for how to play. Again, uh, keeping in mind that anytime you see the pink lightning bolt, you're going to gain that stuff instantly. And then every time you see the black and white arrow, you gain that stuff during your park tour when it's time hits. Otherwise, you are over here, um, you know, drawing however you want to draw on your map and remembering that you need to have either a road or the building touching the edge of the map where the exit is and you cannot count an exit more than once. So ideally, you know, you can see in this instance, I actually got all the way down here in the first round, counted this one, and then failed to get to any other exit uh, until the third round when I circled this one. So I actually only got to count two exits in this game um, because I couldn't come back to the eight again, even though I had a clear path. To there which is why I said okay I'm fine with losing these buildings and these roads connecting this way because I had created a whole new path so at the end of the game you're gonna go down here to the very bottom of your right hand sheet and you're gonna do lots of scoring uh, dinosaur world you score throughout the game and there's very little at the end here you score everything at the end so you're gonna count how many herbivores do you have? They're each worth two victory points. So you write your number here. How many small carnivores do I have? Three. Large carnivores, five. How many specialists have I hired? And that includes your basic ones here or here. You can see they all are worth three VP. Then you're going to come over here to your buildings. What you can do over here is look at your buildings and do the math. So you could say, all right, C is 15. B is, you know, do the math, that one is worth six, and say you didn't do A, so there's nothing there. But once you have your three numbers here, you can add them up and write that single number here. Here's where you're going to write your bonuses for your park exits. Here's where you're going to write your bonuses for your excitement level, and it's basically, it's not cumulative, it's the highest star that you've reached any point on that row. So even if you only got to 51, which is right here, you still get the 24 bonus.
However, if you get to 60 and then start counting even more, in this case I got to 61, you get an additional point per, um, per 61. Now this number is 11 and I'll explain that here in a little bit because of the solo rules. But um, any extra DNA that you have that you did not use, every two DNA equals one, and then you have to subtract for deaths. So how many deaths did I take? Those are straight negatives. So in this case, nine deaths, negative nine points, and anything over 21 deaths is two points. I didn't get there. You add up your total score, and whoever in a multiplayer game has the highest score wins. So that is how you play a multiplayer game. Let's look at the only differences in a solo game. So we're gonna come back over here. We're gonna shift this one off to the side, which by the way, there are a few cards that you're supposed to remove from the game. One of those is the Chaos Theorist, but I'm gonna leave it out here just um, for ease of um, fish finishing up this tutorial. So we have our three objective cards here. And again, you are simply trying to meet these objectives before the end of the game. If you do, you're gonna score the VP in the lower right hand corner. Then you have your AI deck here that you've shuffled. And at the uh, beginning of every round, the beginning of every dice drafting phase, you're going to draw six dice out of the bag. So we do one, two, three, roll them out, and one, two, three, roll them out. And then you're gonna take these six dice and you're gonna randomly arrange them in a line. We'll stick them right here like so. And then we'll put our AI deck over here. Once you've arranged them in a line, you're gonna take the top card of the AI deck and you're gonna flip it over. Notice that when you have it set up so AI can be read, you have it so that the AI actions can be seen and objectives are facing up. As we're no longer caring about the objectives, we're just caring about here. Now, all this is telling you is which dice out of the, the six, counting one, two, three, four, five, six, you take and where you place it. It's always going to work from top to bottom and left to right on the dice. So you can say number one, two, three, I take this, I put it there, and six, I take this, and I put it there. From here on, I get to pick which two dice I want to draft, so which ones I'm going to pull and keep the dice face. So let's say I want these two. This would be a smart play on my opinion, in my opinion, because the out of the two remaining dice, you get to choose one that you get the resources for, so say I want the double security, and the remaining one you get the threat on. So say for example, if this was what I was left with, and I really needed coins, if I did this, claimed my coins, but then I don't get that die, that one goes off to the side, I have to then gain three threat immediately, and again, this one just goes away. Then I'm gonna take these two dice that I drafted, and I'm gonna decide where I wanna put them. I'm the only player, so there's nobody else, but the AI is already blocking me. So if I want to say, raise funds and get two more security, I have to take three threat to put a die there. Um, and that's basically the only difference in the game is that you, um, on each of the dice drafting phases, you will roll out six dice and you will flip over one of these cards. You'll go through, you'll take remove the third dice from the left and the fifth dice from the left, and you'll cover up these two spots. At the end of the game, uh, the only difference in final scoring, and there is no difference in the park tour, as you yourself are just focused on your park and the AI doesn't mess with you. But at the end of the game, any objectives that you've completed, you can add up. There is no spot for it on these sheets, so that's why I simply, in my game, I'm pretty sure I accumulated 10 between the three objectives, so I turned my one extra point into an 11. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you play Dinosaur Island Roar and Write. It can look kind of intimidating. Um, it's you know not quite as clean looking as say cartographers or um, railroad ink. There is you know a lot to see here, but it really is quite straightforward. It is super fast to set up, and 
it's not the quickest roll and write game, but it's also not the longest in my opinion. So a great kind of middleweight game that takes almost no time to set up and get playing. Um, that is how to set up and play Dinosaur Island Roar and Write. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, including playthroughs of both Dinosaur World and Dinosaur Island Roar and Write, please consider subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.